Yeah, he is the world's best facilitator. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, all protocol observed. I'm a seasoned public servant who are very big on protocols. And I was, I was so liberated, Nils, when you didn't get into a whole a lot of protocols. So all observed. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that I'm with the Chief Inspector. Um, also, this is August, a month that is dedicated to women, the incubators of life. The world belongs to us. Men are visiting. I mean, we don't have a men's month in our country, but we've got a whole month dedicated to women. Women are such an interesting species who can do a triple PhD and more. And just in terms of my presentation, please time me. I'm fond of talking. So if I go over the allocated time, just, just be aware. Just be aware that, oh, OK. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think uh, I just want to just introduce my talk by indicating that whatever I'm going to say, it's born in the strategy 20, um, 20 what, Millie? 2020. 2024 to 2029. You see why I brought her. She's a wonderful resource. 2024-2029. It's not a strategy that we just woke up and put together. It's been long in the making. We've got an IES strategy, inspection enforcement strategy, that we've just reviewed. Um, so some of the things that are incorporating incorporated in the strategy that I'm going to be presenting, which is literally a vision of, for our department in terms of the OHS space. We also, it's undergirded by the state of OHS in Africa. It's a study that we undertook together with the ILO. Uh, the participants were overarching and the real role players in the space of occupational health and safety. So Department of Minerals and Resources was part of the study. Health, um, the F F FMA, uh, RMA rather, FEM, and the Compensation Fund. And you know what is the common golden thread amongst all those role players? We are preoccupied with the whole issue of health and safety. It never strikes you how important health and safety is until something happens that could have been prevented. Health and safety, it's something that is so fundamental that it even affects our day-to-day -day life. This morning when I was taking a shower, the first thing, and you know there's learned experience, even at a personal level. If you do the same mistake twice, you're not serious about learning. I remember I was, I love Western Cape, I'm a Western Cape girl, and thanks, Nils, for bringing the conference here. I was in Hermanas, just about to take a, con a, a shower, and then as I was about to step into the shower, I hit my leg. Almost got operated on. A small thing that almost became major. Health and safety hazard. In my years as the Inspector General, I started in 2015 in that position, I've learned that you cannot take anything for granted. Particularly when something can make a difference between the life that you're used to and literally sometimes even losing your life or your limb or whatever. So one cannot overemphasize the importance of health and safety, particularly in the workplace. Um, so like I said, we've got a vision 2029 as a department. Our strategy is based on, I mean, I mentioned those in, in my introduction. The aim of the strategy is to ad address, this is somewhat um, in my way, I'll try and stand here so that I'm able to see what is there. To address the poor working conditions and lack of compliance, maybe one should say inadequate compliance, because there's some semblance of compliance, but it's very inadequate. We're actually recently doing a five-year analysis. In the past, five years, 
from 2019 up to 2024, we conducted over 1.2 million inspections. And you look at compliance levels, particularly in terms of OHS, the hover in and around 45 up to 60 percent. It's unacceptable. We've got to do something about it. Prevention of incidents, injuries, and diseases. A clear plan in terms of what is it that we'd like to do to make sure that the landscape of OHS changes in the country. The strategy will guide the OHS community internally as well as externally. It does take two to tango. So we depend on all stakeholders. And you are one of uh, the important stakeholders. Now, this is an organogram of how occupational health and safety looks like in the country. We've tried to summarize. I'm not going to go through it in any particular details. It's just for you to be aware that OHS is highly specialized. Our inspectors are highly specialized as well. And um, having said that, however, we do still have resources that we feel could be better. Currently, we've got about 670 OHS inspectors, thanks to the compensation fund. Until 2022, we had about only 170. So through that partnership, we're able to grow um, our numbers in terms of presence. Now, this is we're saying within the broader vision of the department, as the inspectorate, we've got a vision, and in particular, as occupational health and safety. We've got a vision to strive for a labor market which is conducive for every worker to work in a healthy and safe working environment. Health and safety has become a fundamental principle, even at an ILO level. And I think that deserves a round of applause to say there's a recognition that when men and women go out there to work, they shouldn't come back in body bags. They shouldn't come back with missing limbs. Because that has got an overreaching implication to the people that are left behind and also to the workplaces themselves. You see, we've got a whole set of values, which I'm not going to go through. Now let's go to the next slide. In our strategy, you'll also find we did a thorough sort analysis. So here it's just some of the things that we picked that we felt are really important in terms of us reflecting on. We've got a whole lot of strengths. We've got a whole a lot of weaknesses as well. And by the same token, we've got opportunities. However, there are still threads that are lagging. We believe that we've got well-documented legislation. It is at start. Our legislation is not adequate, and that is why we keep on... The world is evolving. The labor market evolves. And that is why we keep on reviewing and making sure that we are on par. We've got structures that are tried and tested. We've got stakeholders that we can rely on. Uh, we've got... Um, we even have the ac academia. We've got the experienced... OHS professionals inside the department and outside. We've got uh, a laboratory inside the department that was just established. We've got uh, also partners that can help us in further uh, professionalizing our approach. In terms of our weaknesses, I think for me, one fundamental weakness is that OHS in this country still remain scattered. So you get bits and pieces of occupational health and safety in various departments. We tried through coming up with the state of OHS in the country to bring at least a report that we can all relate to. And I know that in, uh, in the past, there was an attempt to try and bring together fragments of the OHS uh, uh, elements that are lying all over, but I think our work is cut out in that regard. We've got to admit that it is a weakness. It's something that we need to look at. So the harmonization of OHS legislation. Uh, I also want to talk about um, the slow progress in, I'm just picking on some of the weaknesses. 
in terms of the amendment of OHS, it takes us forever. I mean, for me, I believe COVID was a learning period. During COVID, we're able to bring regulations, put them together in the shortest time possible. Where has that experience gone to? It's taking us forever to amend the OHS Act. It's still a bill. It is yet to be passed. Inadequate focus on gender issues. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot run away from the fact that the workforce has become feminized as well. However, when you look at the whole approach, from something I was looking at our, 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 uh, our uh, star sponsor, the PPEs, for me, the irony is that even the PPEs are like men-oriented. You know, as women, we come in different shapes and sizes. And you get into that overall that doesn't even stretch. <laughs> and it hugs you very uncomfortably. Things such as that, it's as basic as that. So we, 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 we've got to look at that. It's a weakness, and every weakness also presents as an opportunity. I mean, I just want to pick on changing technology as well. We cannot afford not to keep up with the times, particularly inward looking. We are looking at an inspectorate that is going to have gadgets that are fit for purpose. You know, I remember the very first time when we, we, we introduced uh, the whole concept of let's make sure that our inspectors have got a sufficient and uh, fit for purpose um, um, tools of trade. Somebody came to my office carrying, I don't want to, name, to tell you the name, the brand of the cell phone, but they had a cell phone in their hand. And he said, hey, Inspector General, look. And then he dropped that phone. I said, okay, what's the point? He says, no, this thing is durable, man. Did you see how hard it hit, but look at it, it's still durable. Durability is one thing, but in terms of technology, is it fit for purpose? We've got the strategic goals and objectives. One cannot overemphasize the fact that we keep on having to talk about promoting healthy and safe and productive and quality lives in both the public and the private sector. There's got to be a change in behavior. It's got to be a culture. It's got to go skin deep. We've got to live, breathe, and think health and safety so that you prevent injuries and diseases. And you remember that our, um, our approach was more on uh, the safety side. And now the health side, we also have to go to, to, to bring it in. So like, you know, when people pick up diseases, it's latent. You don't see it immediately. It's like if you're exposed to uh, maybe, let, let's say, um, asbestos. Over the years, it's doing slow damage. But when a machine injures you, you can see that this person is injured. But with diseases, it takes time. Even mental diseases, it takes time. You know, workplace bullying, it's a health hazard. There are people that are bullies out there. It is a health hazard. It does something to your mental well-being. I'm married to a preacher. I'm a preacher's wife, so sometimes I offer him, please allow me to. What did I do now? I went back. I, I know that that was not part of, part of the preacher's thing. We've got a set of strategic objectives that I mentioned there. And I take it that colleagues are going to be getting presentations because I'd like to emphasize certain parts and not be too long-winded. I don't want the bell to ring, <laughs> not under my watch. <laughs> <laughs> we 
We want a coherent and effective legislation and policy. I spoke about the OHS bill. It's in the making. It's done. It's 99.9% it's .9 done. We just, need to, we just need to do the final touches, then it goes to where it's supposed to go. Our regulations as well. And as you can see, there's a whole lot of things that you're mentioning underneath. What is going to be an enabler when we have legislation that is harmonized? The last point I do want to emphasize, we are a signatory of the ILO. We've signed off um, Convention 155 and 187. They provide a legal framework and also assist us to deal with process issues. You know, somebody once accused, accused us from a department point of, of view that uh, you guys like workshops, conferences, you like talking. A lot of talk shop and... But you know what? I'm a firm believer that a wise person, you allow yourself to change your mind when facts are being presented. You shouldn't get married to a particular viewpoint. And I believe that it's gatherings of this nature that allow us to have conversations. They say if you listen well enough to any person, even the one that waffles, in that waffle, you're going to pick up some nuggets. I've looked at the lineup of speakers. I don't, there's no one that's gonna waffle. I'm just saying. But if you listen carefully, you're going to, we're going to end up enriched. We cannot over talk about some of these things. Internally, we've got um, um, sustained ways of making sure that we stay on par of developments through training, through advocacy, through conferences. We try and professionalize our inspectorate. Did I say just recently, we also put in a lab in head office it was a very proud moment for us in occupational health and hygiene, lab baby steps. There isn't anything much, but it's a good start for us. We also are challenging ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, to go externally and go to areas that have been untapped. Your SME means the informal economy. We've got to preach health and safety. Imagine a guy who's standing by the corner selling loose drawers the whole day. They're just doing this. Sometimes they sit, sometimes they dot. They're exposed to all sorts of uh, environmental and climatological changes. And yet when you talk health and safety, we hardly ever reach those people that are in the informal economy. The waste pickers, I'm not even sure if it's the right term, um, so we want to, to, to reach out. We have already have started. We've challenged ourselves to say, let's go there. Employers and their organizations, employees and organized labor, particularly in the space where people are extremely vulnerable. We do this, like I've said, through workshops, seminars, and so forth. Sometimes one-on-ones. I don't know how many of you have been to the Warwick Junction. We've been there uh, with the full suite of our services, but OHS in particular. Interesting, the measures that they've put in place with all the challenges. What I want to pick up on is that we really want to go the route where um, People will comply because it is the right thing to do, not because they're afraid that inspectors of the department are going to be showing up. Voluntary protection program, it's something that in our strategy has got a place. We want to embark on a silicosis program where we say silicosis needs to be eliminated. It's a health hazard. Toolkits for SMME, I mentioned the toolkits. We still have high risk areas your construction, iron and steel, when accidents happen in that area, 
or those areas, they are far reaching. A case in point will be George. The George structure that just uh, collapsed. And 34 people lost their lives. Almost 60 people were affected. And we are counting people that are directly in that workplace. Not people that are family and other people that are really dependent on them. And societal matters in that regard. There was one something called an RSR, Roving Safety Representative. I was part of it when I was still in Pumalang, where we'll go to the agricultural sector as stakeholders, go advocate and go in the forefront, there'll be people that really matter. We want to revisit some of those practices that got lost in the system. I'm going to skip um, that. I, 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 also, I just want to mention that in terms of the approach that we're taking in the next five years, we're even changing the model of our inspections. So we're just going to be making announcements that for the, a particular week, we'll be conducting high impact inspections in a particular sector nationally. We've started with it. It's working, ladies and gentlemen. If you announce that you are coming for you, iron and steel, even those that don't, don't comply will go and buy PPE for the first time ever. And you know what the good thing is? When you go to workplaces, they will tell you these workers that I, I need to learn. It's new. It's new. It just got purchased today. So you know what the benefit is? We make an announcement that, hey, we're coming for you, the construction sector. And every workplace will do something about that. And then we just choose a few. You're becoming clever. Uh, I spoke about issues of training, um, uh, issues of making sure that at a continuous, on a continuous basis, we remain relevant. We subscribe to um, viewpoints such as Vision Zero. We believe that every workplace incident is preventable. It is possible. If we get our ducks in a row, it is possible. Wh one thing that is coming with the amendment of the OHS bill is that uh, when it comes to risk management, we've gone to town and back. And I don't know, Niels, if there's going to be an opportunity to talk about some of these things in detail. Uh, because, I mean, we're talking about the same subject and chances are we're going to overlap in terms of our talking as speakers. So one good thing that is coming with the OHS um, uh, uh, bill, which is going to be law one day, it is that we've gone to town and back to talk about the whole issue of risk management. And we believe that that is going to take us far. OK, I'm going to pass that. I'm moving towards the end. I spoke about a, a, a list of stakeholders. There's a saying that um, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with people. So with stakeholders, because going fast doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win or that you're going to attain your objective. Have you seen the, recently the Olympics? I like watching athletes, athletes in particular. When you get into a relay, the most important thing, amongst others, is the baton. You can run as fast as you want, but if your exchange of the baton is not going to work, even if you go and you're number one, if you don't have your baton in your hand, you were fast, yes, but did you go far? You didn't. Because you didn't win at the end of the day. So for us stakeholders, we like, we like, we, we, we take a baton and challenges to pass from one person to the other. We build not only for the now, 
but systems and processes that are going to stand the test of time, even for future generations. And I mean, we've listed a whole lot of, st of stakeholders there. It was never the duty of the Department of Labor alone, Employment and Labor alone, to make sure that there's compliance out there. Every single person has got a role to play. That's just a stakeholder matrix. It is the same stakeholders. We've just ranked them in terms of what is it that they bring to the table. But trust me, we value each and every single stakeholders because we believe that, I know it's a cliche, but together we really can do more. In terms of monitoring and evaluation, a, st a strategy has got to be agile, it's got to be a living document, it's got to be able to be tested and looked at from every angle. So we believe that there are institutions that can assist to make sure that this strategy is what it is meant to do. So we've listed some of um, uh, um, the structures that are important the working group members of the interministerial coordination body, the advisory council on safety and health. It's a, it's a legal structure that is given legitimacy through the Occupational Health and Safety Act. We know our job as the department. We've seen as speed cops, you know the speed cop syndrome. Uh, sometimes we are seen as speed cops. We don't want that. We want to be seen as people that are coming into your space to say what is it that you can do to make sure that we do better. I'm so happy that the bell didn't ring. <coughs> now the culmination of our journey. We want a professionalized inspectorate in the true sense of the word. We have a dream. One of our dreams, we even have a business case for it is to put up an inspector's training academy so that our inspectors can do the things that will make change out there. We want to see change in behavior, a clear before and after picture. And we want to see this in all the role players in the labor market in the workplaces. Lastly, we want a healthy and safe workplace. That's our ultimate. To ensure that every worker in all industry work, works in a healthy and safe working environment and that we prevent injuries and diseases, we will need collaboration with all stakeholders as indicated in the stakeholder matrix. The business, labor, government, professional bodies, academia, etc. Your support is coveted to make Vision 2029 a reality because together we honestly can and will achieve more. If you think that compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. That's Paul McCartney, McNally. Thank you.